Hey y'all, welcome to our channel. I hope you're having an awesome week. Last week, if you haven't checked out the video for that, uh, last week we talked about how doctrine matters. A lot of folks will say, man, doctrine really doesn't matter. But when you start actually reading the Bible and you actually start reading what Jesus says and you actually start reading about the expectations that he has for us, lo and behold, what you find is that doctrine very much does matter. And we are supposed to uh, hold on to hold on to the Lord's doctrine and beware of false doctrine. And we talked about how we're going to start getting a little more, uh, perhaps a little more in depth, and this isn't anything rocket science or anything like that, um, but we're just going to start seeing how doctrine really does affect every part of our lives. So I thought in talking about how, how doctrine does affect every part of our life, I thought we might just start with our birth. How are we born? And no, I don't mean physically. Uh, really, I'm, I'm looking at the, the question. There's a lot of folks out there that practice infant baptism, and uh, you never see that in the Bible. Uh, you, you just don't see that. Uh, folks think that you can, but it's simply not there. But the reason that Protestants and Catholics, uh, the reason that they practice infant baptism is because they believe in original sin. And let's just call original sin what it is. They believe that you are born in sin, that you have inherited sin from Adam. And that's what they believe. So I thought I might just talk about that today. And where they, they get the idea, one of their main go-to verses is in Psalm chapter 51. So as usual, and I know I say it every time, but get out your Bible. Get out your Bible, read along, decide for yourself. It doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what anybody else says. Just, just uh, the only thing that matters is what the Bible says. So get out your Bible, read God's Word for yourself. Uh, where they get this idea is it is an abuse of a verse in Psalm 51. Psalm 51 at verse 5, it says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Uh, we can just stop right there. Uh, but they'll really just pull that verse out of context. What you need to do is you need to put that verse back in context. Your Bible might have a heading to tell you what this verse is speaking about, this verse has everything to do with the account, the encounter that David had with Bathsheba. When Bathsheba, uh, when David slept with Bathsheba, and she conceived, and they bore a child, and that child was going to end up dying. And you have that encounter as Bathsheba, remember she was another man's wife, that they were engaging in adultery. They are engaging in sin. And, and those things are what these verses are pertaining to. And it's just a horrible abuse of those verses to pull them out of context and to say, see, that means that we are all born in sin. That means that we are all conceived in sin. That's simply not the case. Uh, it's simply not the case. It's a horrible, horrible abuse of those verses uh, to, to use them that way. It, it really is a, a perversion of those verses. Come up to, come up to Ezekiel. Come to Ezekiel chapter 18, and, and we're going to read a few verses in Ezekiel and just consider about uh, what Israel was griping about, seeing how they were such great gripers. In Ezekiel chapter 18, it says, The word of the Lord came to me again, saying, What do you mean when you use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. See, Israel was, they, they had this assumption, they had this saying that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And, and God is saying, I don't want you to use that proverb, proverb anymore because it's not an accurate reflection of God's will. And let's see what they're really, what they're really saying. In verse 3, as I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. The soul who sins shall die. But, but if a man is just and does what is lawful and right, if he has not eaten on the mountains nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel. And he goes on and on. He talks about how if a man does what is right and what is just. Uh, verse 9, if a man has walked in my statutes and kept my judgments faithfully, he is just. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. Namely, and we're going to read a few more verses, what the Lord is saying is, is that he's going to hold each person responsible for their own sins. 
He's going to hope. He's going to hold each person. He's going to reward, as it talks about in the New Testament. He's going to render each one according to their deeds. Not the deeds of someone else. He's going to hold each person accountable for their actions. Okay? Over in verse 19, you start seeing, you start hearing Israel's uh, complaint. Uh, the Lord says, Yet you say, Why should the Son not bear the guilt of the Father? Right? And the answer is, because the Son has done what is lawful and right and has kept all my statutes and observed them, he shall surely live. The soul who sinned shall die. The Son shall not bear the guilt of the Father, nor the Father bear the guilt of the Son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked man turns from all his sins, which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. Verse 23, Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. See, what are they saying? The children bear the guilt of the father, and the fathers bear the guilt of the children, both ways. And the Lord has said, no, the father is going to be held accountable for his actions, and the son is going to be held accountable for his actions. And Israel comes along and says, Lord, your way is not fair. He says, yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair. The answer, the Lord's answer, Hear now, O house of Israel, is it not my way which is fair in your ways which are not fair? See, the Lord's way is fair and it is just because what original sin teaches, what those who hold to that doctrine teach, is that God holds someone else accountable. God holds you accountable for somebody else's sins, namely Adam's. Does that seem fair and just? God has said in these verses and in other verses that he is going to render each one according to his deeds. The wicked will be on the wicked. Uh, death will be on if a sinner does not turn, he's going to die. But if a sinner turns and does what is right, he shall live. That God renders to each one according to his deeds, not according to someone else's deeds, that we do not inherit Adam's sin. We may pay the penalty, if you will, because Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden and we no longer have access to the tree of life. In heaven, that's going to change, by the way. But we are not held accountable for their sins. We, the Lord does not expect us to repent for the sins of Adam, is the idea. The Lord commands us to repent for our sins, is what he does. God does not hold children. Remember what we're really talking about. We're talking about how we're born. How we're born. Now, does that seem like the sort of God that is painted, uh, the sort of God that is described in Scripture, that God is going to hold babies accountable for someone else's sin? That is a horrible doctrine. That is a horrible doctrine that is just full, full of all kinds of wickedness. That a baby, a baby, is held accountable for someone else's sins that they don't even know about. Okay, let's, answer, let's ask the question, what about babies that are miscarried? What about babies that are not baptized according to their doctrines? Are those babies lost? Do those babies go to hell? Some of those, some of those denominations, they believe just that. That babies, uh, if they are stillborn perhaps, that... They, they believe that, that they go to hell. What a horrible, horrible doctrine. But that's what they teach. But just in considering the doctrine about how we're born, what about John the Baptist? You know, John the Baptist, it talks about him being full of the Holy Spirit even from the womb. Even from the womb, it says. Does that sound like he was born in sin? Does that, born like he was total, does it sound, does that sound like he was born totally depraved? It says he was full of the Holy Spirit even from the womb as he would come preparing the way for Jesus. 
What about John the Baptist, though? Was there something special about his mother and grandmother? Was there something special about his mom? You know, that's what folks say about Jesus, that Jesus did not inherit the sin because of this immaculate conception um, pertaining to Mary. You never read about the immaculate conception. We might talk more about that here in a second. But was that the deal with John the Baptist? Was that why he had the Holy Spirit even from the womb? You don't read that in Scripture. You don't read that... Uh, you don't read about any sort of immaculate conception pertaining to his parents or anything like that. But the one you really have to explain is Jesus. Was Jesus born in sin? And the problem is that Protestant doctrine and Catholic doctrine, that they really can't get around that, so they have to come up with a fa another false doctrine, namely the immaculate conception, that Mary's conception, when Mary was conceived, that she did not inherit sin. You never read about that in the Bible. Let's just speak where the Bible speaks, and let's just be silent where the Bible is silent. And let's just do what the Bible says, and that's what we're talking about. And that's why we're studying our Bibles, to see what the Bible says and to stop listening to all this garbage that all these false teachers are spewing. They are deceived, and they are deceiving others, and we need to pull our heads out of the sand and stop being deceived and to turn back to the Word of God. That's what we need to do. And that's what John the Baptist taught, and that's what Jesus taught. Remember what John the Baptist came doing to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the hearts of the children back to the fathers, to bring people back to God. What did Jesus come doing? He came doing the same thing. He came to save that which was lost. But Jesus, he's our example. He's our example, according to Scripture. So one thing you might say about Jesus is, seeing how this false doctrine of original sin says that I was born in sin that I was born with this sinful nature. But Jesus wasn't born with that. Well, if Jesus was not born the same way that I am, if Jesus was not born the same way that you are, then how is he our example? If he started from another starting point than we started at, then how is he our example? If he did not have to run the same race that we have to run, if, he's not, if he didn't run the same race we have to run, then how is he our example? See, that's the sort of thing you have to answer. Because the bottom line is that the Word did become flesh, that Jesus came as a man, that he was born as we are born of woman. And he did run the race of faith. And he does serve as our example. And he was tempted in all ways just like we are. That that's what Jesus did. In Matthew chapter 18, in Matthew chapter 18, the Lord's going to talk about children. In Matthew chapter 18 at verse 1, Matthew 18 at verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They would ask that question more than once, by the way. They would have that argument more than once about who's the greatest. Verse 2, Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Does it sound like little children are born in sin? Jesus says we have to become like little children. We have to be converted and become like those children. If those children are so sinful... If those children are born so depraved, then why did Jesus say that we need to be converted and become like them? It's because they're not depraved. It's because they were not born with a sinful nature. It's because they were born pure. And when we are born, we are pure. When we are born, we are sinless. We have not sinned. We have not transgressed the law. When we are born, we are born perfect. And that is why, that is why when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he talks about being born again. You just look at that phrase, being born again. He doesn't say being born for the first time, does he? He says born again. Well, if the first time I was born, I was not perfect. If the first time I was born, I was born in sin, then when I'm born again, why wouldn't I be born again in sin? That's the problem with that doctrine. The good news is, is that when we're born, we're born sinless. 
our little boys and our little girls, that they are born pure. They are born innocent. They are born guilt-free. That is what little children are. That is what little babies are. And that is why we need to be converted and become like them. That is why we do need to be born again. If we are not Christians, that is why we need to repent, not of someone else's sins. We need to repent of our sins. We do not get to let someone else make the good confession for us. We confess with the mouth that Christ is our Lord and we are baptized and we are born again. That's the whole beauty of the gospel, that we can be converted and become as little children. The false doctrine of original sin, leave it alone. Leave it alone. It's not found in the Bible. It's not found in the Bible. If you believe that, if you have family or friends that are caught up in that doctrine, uh, try talking to them about it. Try, try looking at scripture with them. Sit down with your Bible in your hand with them. And, and show the truth to them in Scripture. Show them the error of their ways so that we can all be saved, so that they can be saved, so that they can understand the beauty of the gospel, so that perhaps they can understand the necessity of being born again. I hope you've enjoyed this study. I hope you have a good week. God bless you. Thank you for watching.